We're turning to the New Testament and to the book of Romans chapter 14, please. Romans chapter 14, and we're reading some other short scriptures, and then we're going to preach the Word of God. Romans chapter 14 and verse 7, and I'd like you to follow these scriptures and keep your Bible open when we come to the end of our readings very powerful message tonight that we have from the Lord to deliver, and we believe uh, one that is timely. Uh, Romans chapter uh, 14 and uh, verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Now that's a question to Every one of us as believers tonight, why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? In other words, why do you say he is of no good? Why do you say he's of nothing, he's of no use? We need to be very careful in what we say about God's people and one another. Why dost thou set at nothing thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God, and underline the every one of us. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. And we'll pick this subject up again. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work, and notice the individual connotation. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, not what size it is, or shape it is, what sort it is. God's interested in the sort of work we are at. If any man's work abide which he hath which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire, just scrape in like lot. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now go with me to, please, to Ephesians 2 and 1 verse there, a very powerful and important verse. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. I want you to watch this verse very carefully 
because we'll be coming back to it. For we are his workmanship. We belong to him because of the work of the cross. So what this verse is saying to us. For we are his workmanship created, new creation in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now watch this phrase. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In what? In them good works that he has ordained us to walk. Now I want you to turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and there we shall there we shall park and we'll come to these scriptures later on. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 you open your Bible and then you'll not have to fizzle about whenever we need to come there. And we know that God will bless to us the public reading of his word. There are three major judgments mentioned in the Word of God that has to do with saints and sinners alike. Now, there are a number of other judgments which I mentioned last week. Judgment of the nations, judgment of angels, judgment of Satan, and other judgments as well. But there are three major judgments in the Word of God that has to do with saints and sinners, and that includes us. Now, one of these judgments has already passed, and there's two yet to come. <coughs> Last week, we spent most of our time dealing and looking at the one that has passed, and tonight and next Lord's Day evening, we'll be looking at the two that has yet to come. And we're considering this, uh, these messages under the great text of Hebrews 9 and 27, where there the writer to the Hebrews says that uh, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this. And the after this makes it prophetical. These are prophetical meetings. After this, after death, after this, the judgment, and then that makes it fearful. After this, the judgment. Now, for the benefit uh, for those who are not here last evening, the judgment that has passed is the judgment for sin. And whether it's original sin or inherent sin, or sins that we have committed since we as believers got saved and confessed and repented of, Sins of word or sins of deed, they were all nailed to the cross at Calvary. Because the word of God tells us that we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And he that knew no sin was made sin for us. Being dead in sins, he quickened us together. That's where we were having forgiven our trespasses and blotting out the ordinance of transgressions against us, nailing them to his cross. And when John the Baptist pointed to the Savior on the banks of the Jordan, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And on that cross at Calvary, stripped naked and crowned with thorns, the judgment and the wrath of God fell on his Son for our sins so that we could go free. And when a man or woman comes to Christ and really and genuinely repents and confesses their sins and they're born again by the Spirit of God, their sins are cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness, never to be remembered again, no more, forever. They're gone. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Because the wrath and judgment that was due to us was taken by him, for he died the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. 
And through that mighty work of the cross, we have justification, substitution, reconciliation, and glorification. We have some mighty things that happen there at Calvary for us and for our sins. And mighty, it's a mighty thing to be saved and to be born again and on our way to heaven. Christ died for us. He died instead of us, and he died on behalf of us. Once and for all and forever, he offered up that mighty sacrifice and took away our sins on that place called Calvary. Forty-seven years next week, or the, maybe the week after, I'll be enjoying sins forgiven and peace with God. And I came, and I came that morning to the text, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin, and I'm living in the good of it, glory to God ever since. Praise his name. And if, like Luther says, we keep short accounts with God and we live close and we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, we can walk in victory from day to day with victory over sin and not, not that we'll never sin, but victory over sin and we can live a glorious, victorious life in Christ Jesus. But if we sin deliberately and consciously and rebelliously as Christians, we're disciplined for it. We are, we are chastened for it. And uh, some of us know something about that. And mind you, I'll tell you, God knows how to chasten us. But once a man or woman and a boy or girl get saved, really born again, the sins that they were born in and the sins that they committed are gone and gone forever. And they start on a new road. The start on a new road with God, to live for Him, supposed to walk for Him, wait for Him, work for Him, and all the rest. As sinners, we'll never be again judged for our sin, but as servants, we will be judged for service. You see, it's not just enough to say, I'm saved, and that's enough. That's a nonsense. It's great to be saved. But my friend, all these scriptures that we have reading tonight and many, many more in the Word of God tells me that there's a day coming when we have to give an account. And there's a day coming when we will stand at the judgment seat that we're going to see tonight of God. And there's more to it than being saved. And as servants and as sons and daughters, we will be judged for our service. That's what all those scriptures were about that I read tonight. And why I read in Ephesians 2 and 10 was this, was why, this was why. Because we are his workmanship, we, because of the cross work of Christ, we, we are a new creation. We're born again, and that's most of you in here tonight. We're born again, which God before ordained that we should walk in, in him on, on, ordained unto good works. Now, what does that mean? It simply means a way back in eternity past, a way back before the hills and order stood, the Lord God could see us, and he could see the day that he was going to save you, and he could see the day that he was going to forgive you, and he could see your life and everything about it. And a way back in eternity past, there was, he, he has ordained and he has prepared a plan for our life. That's a mighty verse. That's one of the great verses, my friend, that we would need to get into your head in these days when we're hearing so much tripe. Way back in eternity past, we were deigned onto good works, onto service for Him. And so there's a plan and there's a purpose and there's a path for every one of us. And it's our job to find it. And it's our job to do it. You see, we're all saved for a purpose. We're all saved in the mind and the eternal will of God for a purpose, for a plan, for a fulfillment, for a task to be done in the years that we have in this scene of time. This generation, last generation, is responsible for that generation. This generation is responsible for this generation. And God saved you and he saved me and he called us out of darkness and he brought us into the light of the glorious gospel for a purpose. And as we fulfill that purpose, there are rewards for it. Salvation's not a reward. Salvation's a gift. 
But when we come for rewards, we have to earn them. And you'll hear that on Thursday night if you come on the five crowns that are for the believers that have to earn them. And God's not going to throw crowns out to everybody. No, not a bit of them. No, no. And you read the word of God and take the talents of the pounds and the talents themselves that the Lord Jesus spoke about in this context. There's a work for us to do. And there's an accountability for every last one of us. Now, I want to emphasize this again. To say that we're saved and that's enough, that'll do me. Well, it'll not do the Lord. It may do you. It'll not do the Lord. Do you think that he went through the fires of Calvary? Do you think that he was stripped naked on the cross? Crowned with thorns and bludgeoned and battered and spat on and... Gabbatha, Gethsemane, and Golgotha, and all that my dear, lovely Savior took on his own body for our sin. Do you think he done that just to save you and let you live how you like? And he did not. Not a bit of him. Do you think that you pray a wee prayer and you come to the Lord and your sins forgiven and you go back out and you just carry on doing what you always did? That you're going to go to the glory and you're going to look on his face and you're going to walk the streets of gold and you're going to sing throughout eternity on the golden streets and you're going to get five crowns and you're going to wear them and you're going to sing, worthy is the lamb. Forget it. That would be unfair in every way. That would cut across all so much of this book. My friend, we need to waken up. You see, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, if only in this life that we're saved and born again, he says, we're of all men most miserable. It's not a miserable thing to be saved. But, 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 but we, have to, we have to go on and through and believe in the resurrection power of the Lord and live for the Lord. You see, the image of heaven through Scripture is there's two, there's many, there's two in particular. One to fight. Paul says, I have fought a good fight and I have kept the faith. Paul says, we wrestle not. That's put a full stop there for many of God's people know nothing about wrestling. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God and stand against the wiles of the devil. Bunyan and that great hymn of his says, we wrestle on towards heaven against wind and tide and storm. We're in a, my friend, listen, we're in a fight. And from the day and hour we got saved, the battle began. We're in a battle. We're in a battle with a threefold enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. Man, we need to fight. We need to hold on. We need to cry. We need to stand. It's not easy at times. But there's something away out the future that we work for and live for and glory to God is worth fighting for. And then Paul says again, it's like a race that is run, a fight that is fought and a race that is run. He says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He says, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. There's a prize. And I'm going for the prize. Paul went for the crowns for every one of them. Run the race that's set before us. Press towards that mark the judgment seat, the bema, the podium, the rostrum. This is taken in the light of the Corinthian games, the gold medal Corinthians game every two years, 14 miles, kilometers outside the city of Corinth. These great gold medal games were. And, and the judgment seat, the podium where the and where the umpire stood at the end of the thing when, the, when they were lining up for their prizes, it was the bema where we get the word judgment seat from. It was where, he, where, he, where the rewards were given out. 
for those who run the race. And the crowns was laurel crowns, laurel leaves. And some got one, some got two, some got more, some got none. Some finished badly. I pray to God tonight that there's nobody in here who's going to finish badly. I hope you're not finishing badly. I want to finish well. These are rewards. These are crowns. They're diadems. Some have five. Some have four. Some have three. Some have two. Some have one. I'm not taking away from Harvey on Thursday night. The only difference is that the Corinthian athletes were competing against themselves. We are not, or we shouldn't be. It seems to me at times that, it, that we are competing against ourselves. But we are competing and we're running a race and we're in a fight tonight against the world, the flesh, the devil, every damnable thing that the devil can. He nearly wrote me off this evening, by the way. And every damnable thing that we can think of, he's after us. We're in a battle. Who is on the Lord's side? Who has taken their stand for God? And it stands to come common sense. It's just, if there's nothing else, only common sense, you would know that everybody's going to get the same rewards. Do you tell me for one moment that Noah and Lot will get the same rewards? You tell me that Noah for 120 years preached that preacher of righteousness and cried to God, was mocked and scoffed at and held on by faith and warned the people. And I tell you, whenever the flood came, Noah got in to the ark and he got well into the ark. He was as safe as I am. You tell me that Lot who fooled and fiddled about and cahoed about sodomy, making money, and living in sin and condoning things that were going on around them. You heard Alan at it this morning. Do you think for, do you think for one moment that, 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 that Lot and, 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 and Noah's going to get the same rewards? Man, that fellow Lot, he just got in with the very, very smell of smoke in him. He got all religious at the last minute and tried to win souls. It was too late. He got in and no more. I don't want to get in like that. No, I don't want to get in like that. But I'll show you why at the end Peter tells us there's an abundant entrance into his kingdom. Do you tell me for one moment that David and Saul will have the same rewards? That Saul that hunted them was it for 11 years across the mountain like a partridge? And done every dirty thing he could to kill him and to destroy him and his family? And ended up footing about with, with, with demons and witches? And say to himself at the end of the journey, I played the fool. And some of God's people playing the fool, let me tell you. There doesn't seem to be any thought of accountability with them at all, but there's a coming today, let me tell you. And they're coming to the beamer. You're coming to stand before the judges of all the earth, the righteous judge. Don't you tell me that no one lot. Don't you tell me that David and Saul. Don't you tell me that Paul and Demas will have the same rewards. Do you tell me that this man who labored, we're going to see in a minute, who was battered, who was shipwrecked, and went on for God through all sorts of hellish things in his life, Demas has forsaken me. He's gone back to Thessalonica. He's gone back to the idol. You tell me that he left five crowns. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. I heard the last broadcast that came out of Syria the other day, and you know what it was? Where a wife and two children, where a wife and two children were forced to watch, watch their father and their husband being crucified on a cross. They were made watch them. They, they, they made sure they watched them, walk, walk around them and hit them, that they kept their eyes open to watch their father crucified, crying on a cross because he wouldn't recant the name of Christ. Do you think that he's going to get, we're going to get the same reward as him? When we run and cower at everything, anybody scares us, we're away. God help us. Not a bit of it, my friend. You see, the Bible tells me that there's tears in heaven. 
a strange place for tears to be. Hmm? It says that he shall wipe away all tears from off her ass in heaven. What would the tears be? Well, I was reading where one fellow said, the tears will be because, and he has a good point, but I don't agree with it. He says the tears will be because we look around and we'll see that our loved ones are not there. But I don't think we'll be thinking and seeing in heaven like that. I have that notion. That wouldn't be heaven to me. But wouldn't it be an awful thing if you looked around and saw your son and your daughter not there and you fooled about and never prayed for them, never come to a prayer meeting? Hmm? Twisted and turned and ran from one church to another. I saw, they used to sing, someone come here and sing, I dreamed I searched heaven for you. Don't know about the theology or not, but. I don't think the tears in heaven will be because of that reason, but I know that God says he'll wipe away tears, so there must be tears. And here's where I I believe one of the reasons that there'll be tears in heaven. Here's what he says. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast your crown that no man take it. Now, when it says hold, Jesus, hold fast the crown. You see, you could have earned a crown by now, and you could, you could lose it. You could lose it. He says, hold it fast. Well, if you're going to hold something fast, there's a wee fellow there goes out of the meetings, and I play games with him sometimes and go for a sweets, and I tell you, you'd have bother getting sweets out of that boy's hand. Hold fast. Hold tight. Let no man take your crown. Wouldn't it be an awful thing to be in heaven? So there's a boy there and I should have had that crown. There's a woman there and that crown was mine. I had it and I lost it. I fooled about. I wonder would that be why? Or when we look in his face, I wish... I had given him more. Well, I draw tears from us. Spent my life making money. Running the country. Best of my life's gone. I've never surrendered. I've never sacrificed. I've never been broken before God. I just do my own thing. Work every hour I can get from myself. And do we daily reading in the morning and one at night, maybe if you're not too tired. My friend, he didn't die for that. He didn't die for that. Not a bit. Second Corinthians four and verse eight. Look at this. Get your eyes on these verses as we come down to a close. Here's what Paul says. He says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Isn't God good? Always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord, the stigmata, the marks that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Do we know anything about dying for the Lord? We heard it this morning. Do we know anything about full and utter consecration and brokenness and weeping and confession and surrender to the Lord, taking up our cross? Well, that's what the apostles on here. And he goes on, we have the same, uh, verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. Verse 13, we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed, as faith, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe in there, 
they're speaking. Now watch this word knowing, and you'll get the word knowing four times right down into the, into the middle of chapter 5. Knowing, that is to know without a doubt that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us, us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might to the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. Now watch this. But though our outward man perishes, and I tell you when you come to 70 and over, you know whether it's perishing or not. Our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Watch this now. For our light affliction is but for a moment. Now I tell you, Paul, if Paul's affliction were light, if all this that this man went through were light, think of the things that he went through. Trouble, perplexed and, and wounded and in other scriptures fasting and night and day in the deep stripped and shamefully entreated. He says it's only a light affliction, it's only for a moment. But it worketh in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Watch this, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know, and there should be no division in there in, the, in that chapter. He's at the know again. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now watch this. For this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is in heaven. What he's saying here, I'm groaning to get this old body off and get a new body like unto his glorious body. That's not talking about heaven here, although you can refer to that, but he's talking about the new body that he's going to have, like unto his glorious body, which is from heaven, it says in verse 2. And if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we are in this tabernacle, there that do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Watch the knowing again. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, but we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You see his afflictions, and you see his assurances. He's assured he has no doubt that one day it's going to be, he's going to put off this old body with all his pain and trials and suffering and rheumatism and arthritis and everything else that we have. He's going to put it all off. He's going to have a new body like unto Christ. And what will it matter if we suffer a wee bit down here for a little time? It's only a light affliction. What does it matter if a few pains and aches and we... You're bedridden. What does it matter? So it's only the old body and it's given away. It's going to dissolve. One day we have a house, a new house. We have a house eternal in the heavens and we have a new body fitted for that house. And glory to God, I believe the apostle is so excited here. And he's talking about his, his assurance that he has. And then in verse 9, watch this now. He talks about his acceptance. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, doesn't matter, he says, whether we live or die. He says, I'm going to labor on for the Lord. I'm going to go for the crowns. I'm going to go into the blessing and into the victory and into the glory. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. That's it. That's it. Not of men. Not what people think. Not what people, just as long as I'm accepted of him, I'm doing it all for him. Ah, my friend, I tell you, the Apostle Paul had got some grip of that. Wherefore we labor, we strive, we fight, we battle, we run to be well pleasing in his sight. It says in Hebrews in the same context. Another translation that is that we might be received with open arms. Whether they live or whether they die, what men think, what they say, what they do, how they batter and beat them and mock us, and matter what to do with us, have one goal, one motive, and that is to be accepted of him. Is that yours? Is that mine? Just to be accepted of him. 
his acceptance, his afflictions, his assurances, and his affliction. And we see in closing the appearance. Watch this verse now in a minute. But before we come to this verse, let me say this. This is our verse for the night. Verse 10. For we must, for we must all appear. And that's why he's doing that. And that's why he's saying that he comes down and culminates in this verse. I want to be accepted of him at the judgment seat. But you see, let me do this just a wee minute. You see, we're accepted in the beloved. That's salvation. When we come to Christ and receive the gift of eternal life, we're accepted. Him that cometh to me, I will in no way cast out. And Paul puts it, he says, we're accepted in the beloved. And then we're accepted in the will in his will. And Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind unto that which is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. That's consecration. But here he's accepted in his, being accepted in his laboring, that's for his motivation. Accepted in him, that's the standing. Accepted by him, that's for service. Accepted of him, that's our state that we're going to end up in. Accepted by him. A uh, United States of America reporter interviewing Billy Graham in one of the big shows some years ago now, talking to him about his meetings and his mission. Let me tell you, Billy Graham was mightily used of God. And I'd say that after Moody and some of them men in America was none as much used as Sankey and Moody. Billy Sunday and people can say what they like about him R.T. Candle used to say he says I used to criticize Billy Graham but I kept knocking into too many of his converts and I stopped it and I said to Billy Graham one day are you going to hear well done he said I'd like to but I doubt it I'd like to, but I doubt it. Where, where does that leave me? There's the affliction, there's the assurance, there's the acceptance, and there's the appearance. Get your eyes on that verse and we'll finish now. For we must all, now I want you to notice this, Another scripture says everyone. This is an individual appearance. We're not being a crowd. We're going to meet him individually. I believe the talents tell us that. If you study the parable of the talents and the pounds. And I believe that we're going to see him individually. The review will be individually. Now, notice the inescapability. We must. We must. Now, you can twist and turn that way, whatever way you like, and put all the Greek and Hebrew words and all the other words into it that you like. But at the end of the day, it's you must. The same word as, if you're not saved here tonight, you must be born again. It's the same word where it says the Son of Man must be lifted up. It's inescapable There's the inescapability, then there's the individuality. We all, everyone, every knee shall bow. And every tongue confessed, and every mouth shall be stopped before God. We're at the bar of judgment, and the clock is ticking. Can I tell you we could be there before 12 o'clock? Oh, 
this is not something just to weigh down in millenniums to come. Don't be getting that into your mind to satisfy you. No, no, the rapture. Any moment now. He's on his way back. The dead in Christ shall rise first, we which are alive and remain be caught up. The very next thing's the review. And then Thursday night, the rewards. And then the reunion. And then the revelation. When he'll reveal himself to the world. So we're very near the Bema. Every man and woman that died from Adam that was saved. There'll be some crowd. Well, we're not going anywhere. We'll pass from time into eternity. Or me no hurry. No hurry. You'll not have three jobs to do that day, sir. No, no. Accountability time has come. What have you done with my son and service from the day you got saved? Because he says in that one of them verses, it's all going to be, it's all going to be burnt up. Wood, hay, or stubble. It mightn't be much sin in some of it. But of no value. You take a bottle of wood and a bottle of hay and a bottle of stubble and put it beside the gold and the silver and that verses, and I'll tell you there's some difference in them. It's not, it may not be sinful things. They're going to be burnt up. They're of no value. They were of no value to God. Things that we were doing, what value was that for God? Oh, we said it was of God, not a bit of it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. And when I'm dying, how glad I shall be. The lamp of my life was blazed out for thee in the light of the judgment seat. I tell you, I said this before, and a woman tackled me after the meeting. I live in fear of it. And she says, I'm not living in fear of it. I'm living in sins forgiven and peace with God. But I tell you, there's an accountability coming. Inescapability, we must individuality, we all indefensibility. There'll be no barrister, no solicitor, no lawyer, no excuses, because this is the righteous judge. And he's not going to judge us for sins or sin, they're forgiven. Nothing that the failure shall enter here. I don't know where the great white throne judgment is going to be that we're having next week, but I'll tell you, one thing, it'll not be in heaven. For nothing that the failure shall enter. There's an awesome, an awesome message next week. We're not going to be judged for sin. We're going to be judged for service. What sort, sort, sort. S-O-R-T. Erwin Luther, the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, says he doesn't think that the Lord will say anything. He says we'll know by the rewards and we'll know by the look on his face. A very good point. We'll know by the look in his face. Let me leave you with these. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says, In order to win the incorruptible crown, I run the race, I fight the battle, I keep my body under subjection, so that by no means when I preach to others, I myself should become a castaway. That's not a salvation castaway, but his reward. Listen to John and 2 John and 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we wrought or work for, 
but that we might receive a full reward. Listen to Peter. Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fail, for an abundant entrance shall be delivered unto you into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to our Lord at the end of Revelation, which he says himself, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward, my award is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I want to hear, well done. But I doubt it. A.W. Tozer says he doesn't believe that there'll be one Christian be able to look the Lord in the eyes. On that day. Oh, my friend, is it closed tonight? And I'm not only speaking to you, dear people, tonight. I'm speaking to a large audience tonight. I know that. Let me say to you tonight, don't waste your life. And a lot of it's gone with some of you. Don't waste it anymore. Building things that are going to be knocked down and destroyed. What will it profit a man if he gain the whole world? May God help us to live with eternity's values in view. May God help us to work and walk and live for him in the fear of God day by day, reverential fear of God, that we will finish well. Many, many, many of God's dear people have fallen at the last hurdle. Down we could go very quick. May we pray for one another. May we encourage one another. And may we have that great motivation just to be, whether we live, whether we die, this week coming in, all I want to be is to be sure I'll be accepted by him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight to us. It is the living word of the living God, inspired, mighty word. Lord, we don't like it at times, and we don't like this word judgment. We don't like the word hell. We don't like the word repentance. We don't like many words because it doesn't suit us. But our Father, we have quoted scripture tonight, only some of that that you have given to us regarding the future life and the after this. And Lord, I pray that each one of us will utilize our gift, whatever way it is, for God, that we might use our tithes. God, help us, Lord, that we not rob God. We not throw him a wee bit just at the end. For one day we will stand before thee, Lord. And we'll give an account for our tithes. We'll give account for our talents. We'll give account for our time. We'll give an account for a testimony. Oh God, I pray tonight. Thou will speak to my heart as you have done through this message and help me to live with eternity's values in view. Part us now in thy fear and with thy blessing. For Christ's sake, amen.